And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in, for signing up, tuning in. Uh, here it is uh, Wednesday, June 10th, and the soccer balls uh, are going to be rolling soon. I'm Mike Borslow, your executive director, and I'll be joined tonight for the presentation by Ian Moliner. And then uh, in the control room and, uh, and piloting the ship is, uh, is Rob Holiday. He's going to be there to just make sure that we, we stay on track uh, and that uh, any, anything that we miss, he'll chime in and he'll also be uh, providing us with the, with, with the Q&A. And I knew that was going to happen. So, um, so we're uh, we're getting ready for a uh, okay. If it's not the dogs, it's going to be the phone. So we're getting ready for a uh, for a, a a nice presentation with you going through a lot of material. So uh, before I start, I just a couple of things I want to uh, offer a uh, a thank you uh, to everybody out there that's uh, involved with our soccer world or connected to whatever with the central workers. Uh, people that are working uh, in, you know, at the hospitals, at the clinics and doctor's offices, um, at the supermarkets, delivering our goods, uh, our waste removal, everybody considered an essential worker. We all appreciate everything that you're doing, putting yourself at risk, uh, you know, for the virus uh, so that we uh, can basically live our lives in, in, in comfort and, and hopefully heading in, in the right direction. Also to our first responders, a call out to uh, those folks that are um, out there uh, and, and ready for everything from our police officers, our uh, medical folks, EMTs, firefighters, uh, and our National Guardsmen. So uh, thank you. And also, uh, as always, just like to uh, take this time to thank all of the, uh, the folks that have served or who, who currently serve or have family serving um, in the armed services. Thank you uh, to everybody uh, for uh, being a part of uh, protecting us here on, in, in, on, on this great uh, country that we have. And uh, also just like to share, we, we have put this out on social media. It's been on the cover on, on the, the website. We talked about it at the AGM and just want to uh, let everybody know that uh, Massey Soccer has uh, always, always his practice uh, uh, what we you know what we preach which is inclusivity um we uh take a look at uh, everybody involved in our worlds uh through the lens of a soccer ball uh soccer balls uh don't discriminate they uh they want to be kicked and they want to have fun and they they want to be played with and uh and so you know we 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 treat people the same way we do a soccer ball it, it is it's a part of a game it's enjoyable it's fun and, uh, and that's the way we should treat each other with respect, dignity, uh, and, uh, and making sure that we, we appreciate our differences and, and we embrace them as well. And, uh, and I think that I know everybody that I've dealt with throughout the state, uh, that I've never run into any issues uh, with, uh, that are alarming uh, enough to, to cause any, uh, any concern for us. So, Thank you everybody for, uh, for being a part of this, this incredible team. And folks, sports heal. It's amazing. But uh, you know, we all know that you know, how many people here are so anxious to have you know, uh, the MLS kick off or you know, watching you know, the EPL or, or the Bundesliga or Serie A or, you, you, I mean, I think some people are, are really looking forward to uh, you know, live streaming you know, soccer from Iceland. So, uh, which is actually pretty good. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time to get back, back into the game. Um, just a real quick where we are is, where we are is uh, we're now in phase two. Phase two started on Monday and Massachusetts Soccer uh, took the position when phase one rolled out uh, that uh, we took the position of three weeks from the official start date which was May 25th for youth sports, even though phase one started on the weekend before. So we, um, we extended ours to June 14th and we're glad we did. Uh, number one is that, as you can tell, there's a lot of information to digest. The guidelines that the Department of Health came down with, US Youth Soccer came down with, US Soccer, 
Uh, anybody who just basically thought they could just turn the key in the car on Monday, go out and play, as you know from reading everything, it's uh, a little surprising. Um, there is there is quite a bit of content there, but quite frankly, the majority of the content is stuff we already do, and we'll talk more about that. So we're uh, in phase two, starts up on Monday, which we're calling the activities phase. It's the it's soccer activities can commence on Monday. We'll get more into the specifics of it. Uh, and that's what's going to take place. Now, the earliest that phase two can end and phase three starts is June 29th. The governor has used a three weeks a week segment. And so the earliest uh, phase three can start is June 29th. Um, and that, of course, runs that week into July 4th. By then, most kids are out of school. And we also you know, fully understand that you know, starting on June 29th, or at least for the next few weeks, field permits are gonna be rather difficult or impossible to get. So we understand that and we're, and we're taking that into consideration as we provide you with our plans and the such. But if uh, phase three starts, and I'll touch more on uh, what we think phase three will bring about. You know, before I get going, I, I will share that we were caught a little off guard by what phase two would look like. Um, I uh, am serving on, on the, uh, the Lieutenant Governor uh, Task Force, which is overseen uh, by individuals from the Department of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Uh, so I sit on a task force for youth sports with representatives from uh, nine other sports that are played in the state, uh, ice hockey, baseball, basketball, volleyball, wrestling, softball, uh, lacrosse, uh, and several others. So. And we, we, we have meetings scheduled coming up to talk about phase three. Uh, phase two kind of caught us off guard because we thought we would have the ability to have more people on a field and with a little bit more interaction. And so as the final stages came up uh, and as we were leading up to the phase two announcement last week, the governor decided that he would like to have child care and child summer camps, which are not the sleepovers, but the day camps. He wanted to have childcare and, and summer activities for children to drive the bus, to be the lead. And as you have all seen the information that's come out with regards to summer camps, summer activities, childcare, it's cohorts or it's groups of 10 or 12, depending on the age, and that it's one counselor uh, to a group. And actually the way it works for, for child summer camps, which is typically your parks and recs camps uh, that are held uh, during the summertime, is that what they have come out with for the camps and, and summer activities and childcare is that a group or a cohort must remain the same every day that they report. So uh, we have a little bit more uh, wiggle room there because uh, unless you're running a soccer camp, you're gonna, and we'll talk about that too, you're gonna need to abide by that but for youth sport organized activities, practices, um, you don't have to keep the same cohort or the same group together on a Tuesday and a Thursday. But we'll talk more about who must stay together at the time of practice. So it kind of caught off, off guard, but quite frankly, we're pleased with what we got, which is the ability to go out and uh, enjoy the sport and get our kids outside for physical and, and, and mental healing. Uh, there's just so many uh, various things that, that, that need to be addressed. I'm gonna put a quick plug in. Uh, we do have a coaching conversations session coming up on Friday, uh, where we, we, we will be talking about the mental aspects of what we as administrators and coaches need to be aware of when kids are returning after this, you know, this time of, uh, of being sequestered and or, uh, you know, quarantined, whatever you want to call it, this, this stay at home. Uh, we're going to be dealing with a lot of different issues. And so if you can be with us Friday, definitely uh, get on our website uh, and sign up for that. Uh, seats are filling up fast. So I uh, wanted to put that in. Uh, just a quickie, we, we had it up earlier and just going to let everybody know that uh, questions will be submitted via the Q&A uh, option and they'll be answered at the end of the meeting. So if you've got any questions and you want to put them in, fine. If we answer them, we'll try it. We'll probably end up deleting it. If you want to write it down and type it in towards the end, that's great. I, hopefully I answer most of your questions. And if not, 
uh, we'll get to them at the end as, as much as much as possible for sure. And then anything we, we, we don't have time for, you can email Ian, you can email me. We're there to help and, and, and answer any, any questions you have. So, um, you know, we understand there's a lot of anxiety for sure. Um, you know, uh, I live in a household, you know, where my wife is the, 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 the primary uh, caregiver for her mother, 93 years old. And the only one that's been in to see her, um, you know, she uh, went to Market Basket for the first time last weekend after, I mean, after what, three months. And, and uh, I think she bought everything because I only buy stuff that was on the list and that's it. So uh, anyway, um, it's, th there's a lot of anxiety, uh, parents, children, everything that we're dealing with on, on getting out there and we, and we get it. We understand that a lot of uh, organizations may just take a pass on this phase, on phase two. They might say, hey, you know what? We're not gonna get field permits or if we do, then we gotta ramp up, we need some training time. Let us just kind of wait until phase three, which is pretty much phase three will be our July and August months. Uh, and so that, and that's perfectly fine. This is a great opportunity to, uh, to gather your PPE, to educate everybody because I will tell you this is most of the information that we put out there is going to be consistent from phase three, probably into phase four. It's the same things that we do right now when we go to the store, wash our hands, PPE, face mask, six foot distancing, keep our, you know, don't touch anything that we're not supposed to touch, get back in the car, sanitize up and, you know, take the mask off, drive home and, and the whole routine. We've all gotten used to this, and, and that's mostly what the guidelines are about, is just continuing our social distancing, uh, proper hygiene, which is so we can basically curb the spread, you know, cur you know, put a, you know stop the curve. Um, our children want to get back to soccer and so for so many reasons, and so we're going to do everything possible we can to help you with that process. And, um, and we're, uh, we're excited about it. So let me do this. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Hopefully I uh, don't have anything up there I don't want to share, which would be, uh, oops, I'll go over here. And uh, can you see the, uh, the, the home screen? Uh, give me a thumbs up, Ian. Thank you very much. There we go. So there's our, uh, our home screen and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to MA Safe Soccer. Those of you that have been familiar with our website, we've had this alert section up in the middle, uh, which could take you right to the page. But we actually, in our Massachusetts uh, Safe Soccer section, which hopefully you all have had the opportunity to take a look at, it's all about uh, player, coach, participant health and wellness. Um, this has been up for close to a year now. It's got some incredible content that we all should be taking a look at on a frequent basis, having to do with player safety, player health and wellness and the such. So we uh, definitely, if you haven't taken a look at this page, we invite you to do so for sure. We have a section, Return to Soccer Activities, uh, the advisory communications. Uh, this is the page that basically shares all the emails that have gone out uh, from the very beginning. So uh, that's there for you to take a look at. Uh, but the, uh, the important page under MA Safe Soccer is our guidelines and resources. As you've prepared to attend tonight, <clears throat> we hope that you've spent time on this webpage, that you've taken a look at the various documents. Because for me to have to go through these individually, that would be, a, 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 it'd be like a Netflix uh, you know, uh, 10, 10 episode deal. Um, not going to go do weekly reader, but I am going to point out some certain certain things to you. What we're going to focus on in the beginning is the uh, return to soccer activities guidelines uh, right here. A couple of things I want to point out before we, we quickly go through this is we started developing our guidelines as soon as we had some idea of when we would be able to, uh, to get close to a, a phase where soccer could take place. So we've been paying attention to everything that the CDC has been sharing, not only with youth sports, but with camps, with, uh, with clinics, with gatherings, 
uh, for facilities and all that. So we've been paying very closely and, and, and taking a look at what the CDC has put together. We also have uh, been very closely watching and slightly involved in the development of U.S. Soccer's Play On initiative. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. It's, uh, it's great information. The crazy thing is that when you take a look at the CDC, but mostly uh, U.S. soccer with their play on and then U.S. youth soccer with their return to soccer activities, is that they've, um, every state's different. Every state's different. Um, we have four phases. Some states have, uh, have yellow, green, and red. Uh, some states have three phases, some have five. It's everybody's different. So when you take a look at any of the documentation from any of the, the national groups, such as U.S. Soccer, it won't match up to what we're doing, okay? But it's great content that we've taken that content and we've provided it in our guidelines. Just quick mention is that the U.S. Youth Soccer Return to Soccer Activities um, your own Ian Mulliner was actually on that national task force for U.S. youth soccer in helping to provide guidance in the developing, developing those guidelines. So uh, we've, uh, we're fortunate to have had Ian in, involved with that process. Uh, and then lastly, of course, um, are the Department of Public Health guidelines that came out uh, last week having to do with youth sport. We, we had previous uh, COVID orders that we were following, and then we had the guidance from the Department of Public Health. And uh, we feel that we've had the opportunity to get everything together and provide that in our guidelines. And so the guidelines may seem like a lot of information, a lot of material, but, but quite frankly, you know, there's a page for coaches, there's a page for parents, parents, page for players. So, um, it's, it's a lot of information, but each category in itself takes up a page and a half. So it's really not that much because there is quite a bit of redundancy in it. So before we zip through the guideline, because what I want to do is I'm going to try and speed through the guidelines, go through our checklist, because it's important that we spend a majority of our time at the end of this with the Q&A. Um, we'll, we're going to make the assumption that you've looked at the guidelines. Uh, that you uh, have highlighted certain sections, that you're going to have certain questions on certain topics, and that, you know, we'll, we'll jump to that. But a couple of things, that, uh, there's just some must-dos as an organization. I know we have parents, I know we have coaches on with us, for sure, uh, but when it comes to the, our member organizations, our towns, clubs, and leagues, there's a few must-dos here, and most of this is really for the town programs and clubs. Must-dos are Number one, with the guidelines, with the checklist, with the coach's toolkit, is read them and understand them. And then read them again. And just read them one more time. Uh, a lot of your questions will be answered. If they're not answered, send them to us, ask them tonight, send them to us, and we are going to start to build an FAQ uh, document that's going to support all this work that we're doing right right now. So that's number one. Number two is every organization needs to identify a COVID officer. Okay, it's the, it's the COVID safety officer. We'll touch a little bit more on that as we go through this, but that basically is going to be our go-to person, just like we have a registrar, just like we have a treasurer, or we have a president, and then of course we have our query submitter risk manager that safety officer will be our go-to person when it comes to getting information out to our member organizations. You know, very similar to soccer activities is everybody should have a director of soccer development, a DSD identified. You'll also need to have a COVID safety officer. And folks, this is a requirement. We're gonna to have to have that person identified uh, because um, what's gonna happen is that if you don't have a COVID safety officer identified and you put in a COI to use fields, we won't issue the COI until we have that safety officer identified. So we have to, we have to have that person. Most likely, most people are gonna appoint their risk manager because it is in the risk management field. Sorry, query submitters and risk managers, if I'm putting something else on your plate, but quite frankly, it is not a lot of heavy lifting. 
Uh, your responsibility is basically to make sure that information is available, disseminated, and provided, which is what websites are for. So uh, that the other thing that we'll ask you to do is post a link on your website to this web page. Don't post a link to the guidelines. Don't post a link to uh, any of these resources on the right-hand side, because if we update those, the link is going to die. So the best to do from your website is just to provide a link to this page from your website, and you will have the most up-to-date and current information available. Make it real easy on you. Is just any questions regarding return to soccer activities, click here and send everybody in your club and, and, and town program right to this web page and you'll be all set. And we're gonna be keeping it up to date. In addition, we will have additional follow-up webinars as we get close to phase three and we, and we know what that looks like. So please uh, definitely do that. You don't have to rewrite anything, recreate anything. All of this content should suffice for your activities. You also may want to uh, arrange what we're doing tonight. Is a Zoom or a Google Teams or a WebEx or, you know, or any type of a gathering that you're allowed to have these days uh, to get your people together and introduce this material to them. Uh, for sure, you know, if you have a coaches meeting, here's your content right away. Um, you know, if you're not going to be participating in phase two and phase three is going to be maybe some lightweight summer activities or nothing at all, then fine, you can wait. But don't put it off until September 1st. You know, start your communications and your meetings in August. And if you're using Zoom, just record it and get it to the people who couldn't attend and just have them sign off that they watch the recording or something along those lines. If you are going to be participating in phase two and in phase three this summer, just remember that all of your adults need to be in full compliance. Background checks, quarry checks, safe sport, abuse prevention training, and concussion training. Nothing new there. But let's just make sure that they're all in compliance with that. The new registration platform that we'll be using for the 20, fall 2020 season is going to be introduced next week. Mary Relic uh, is going to be rolling that out with more training and content than you, you ever asked for, well, follow-up webinars and such. But that'll track all of these four components, just like the, the system that we unfortunately didn't get to use this spring. So uh, it, this basically, we're going back to Affinity, which Stack Sports bought, and we're going to be in a really, really good place. So we're, we're looking forward to that. And lastly, uh, please make sure that everybody has permits for the fields that you're on. I can guarantee you this much. Right now, every municipality, every private landowner is... Uh, I guess it's, it's rather sensitive right now, it's the best way to put it, is that the last thing that they want is using, somebody using fields without permits um, because they just, they, they just don't want to take risk that may be out there. So make sure you have permits. Um, the COI process is still the same. If you're going to be doing any activities and you had certificates of insurance for fields that are basically are Firing at the end of this month, uh, then uh, renew them. Send a new request in and uh, ask for the certificate to be uh, issued for a field uh, that you have a permit for, that you have a permit for uh, up to August 31st, and you'll be all set. And typically, anyway, if you got any permits, uh, they end in August because that's when our policy renews. And then September 1, you would have to just put in for. for new COIs anyway. <clears throat> so uh, let me quickly take a look at the guidelines. I'm just going to scroll through with you. Uh, I know we basically want to see a half page at a time. So uh, I, I just, I could reduce it just a little bit, but at my age, I won't be able to read it. So as we uh, take a look at this, here's the guidelines. It's dated uh, June 5th. Uh, 
I'm once again assuming people have a chance to go through this. So if this is the first time you're seeing it, <clears throat> great. I'm not going to read it to you. This is going to make for great reading tonight, this weekend. And, uh, and then if you have questions, once again, come back to us and we'll be help, help, happy to help you out. So we, we introduced the return to soccer activity guidelines. One of the things we want to make sure, and you know, I, I have to read these things uh, because people with the uh, words ES, letters ESQ at the end of the name say, say I have to, is that the information contained in this document is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, all contact, including text, graphic images, information are provided for the general informational purposes only. Uh, not as good as the guy does on the radio when he when he reads the uh, all that, that those words. Uh, another thing too is important to understand. The governor has clearly stated, and the lieutenant governor have clearly stated, if they're not comfortable with the trends, with the data, with the direction that our state is going in, they could just as easily go from phase two back to phase one. Or when we're in phase three, they could just as easily go from phase three back to phase two. So I just want to make sure everybody's aware is that uh, we're following what the Department of Health tells us to do. We're not making up our own rules. We're uh, not looking for loopholes. We're following what was printed and provided to us in addition to what's been said daily when the governor gives his briefings. So I just wanna make sure that you're all aware of that. So phase one, we just came through phase one, no organized youth sports. We were happy to see uh, hundreds of players take advantage of top techers and are still using it right now, uh, which uh, we made available to everybody uh, at no cost, uh, you know, initially. And that uh, it's a great home training tool. Kids can watch a video. They can practice on their own. They can send it in, into, a, into, a, into a coach and so forth. So there's, uh, you know, a lot of home training that's been taking place. I do know that there's been a lot of windows broken, pictures knocked off of bookshelves, uh, patio doors uh, kicked in, and of course, uh, more garages with dents in it than anybody could imagine. Uh, so, you know, we, like everybody else, uh, are so excited to get out of phase one. So we're in phase two. I'm quickly gonna review this, but Ian will spend more time on it. But phase two is a soccer activities phase. Basically, folks, in a nutshell, it's groups of 10, players and coaches included in that group, on a field, in a space of any size, but they must have at least 20 feet in between their practice area and the other closest practice area. So if you take a full-size soccer pitch and cut it into quarters, you nestle a space for the 10 players into each of the four corners, give yourself a 20 foot buffer zone, uh, both on touch and on goal line. And you've got your 10 players out there or nine players and a coach, eight players and two coaches. One of the things to pay attention to, we did get a question early is, a coach cannot go from one quadrant or one group to another. When practice starts, it's that coach and those players for that practice. So if it's 60 minutes or, or if it's gonna be 90 minutes, uh, that group stays together. The other group uh, should have a parent or a coach with them. Older ages, if you've got uh, the older kids out there, you know, we always think it's a good idea to have parents um, on both sides or coach on both sides. But if they're only 20 feet away and it's older kids and you can yell over to, to them to, to run various things, you could have 10 players on one quadrant and you could have nine players and a coach on the other. But folks, I wouldn't go below you 14s or eighth graders on that because then you're going to get somebody runs straight across the buffer zone to a coach. This is coach. Now, how do we, how do we do that exercise again? And all of a sudden uh, we've got, 
I don't want to use the word violation, but you know, something that's not supposed to be done. So let's use our brains, let's use common sense, yet let's use logic on this. But that's the, uh, that's the, phase, uh, the phase two that we're in. Groups of 10, uh, players and coaches, and they're the same for that session. Now let's say you've got a training session that takes place, 90 minutes is up, the team is left. You want a 30 minute buffer in between each of those sessions. And then, you know, you're doing this on a weekend and then another group comes in. The coach can still be there for the next group. You can have the same coach there, group, train another group of kids. But you can't have kids return. They're one practice in and then out, okay? In addition, you'll need to keep attendance uh, in the event tracing is needed. So that's, uh, you know, touch more on that a little bit later on. So what I like to do is kind of uh, take a view of this uh, for, you know, like picture yourself on, on a journey. You're a, a, a board member or a leader in a, in a club or a board, a club or a town program, and you say, okay, how do I digest this? Well, let's start here is the criteria uh, for phase two, which is mostly adopted from US youth, uh, US youth Soccer Guidelines. Stuff we're used to, having parents before they arrive take their temperature of the, ch the child before training starts. We are not taking temperatures at the field. Do not take temperatures at the field. The second you take a temperature and the second you write that temperature down on a piece of paper, you then, brought your organization into the world of needing to be HIPAA compliant. Unless you really get into that stuff, do it, but I doubt anybody is into that stuff. Let that just stay out of the equation. Uh, don't make any notes about anybody's uh, uh, health situation. Don't record anything uh, at all, because once you, you maintain any recordings of data, you're getting into, uh, into personal information that, that should not be uh, recorded. So let the parents do the work before coming, and we are expecting parents to do that. So uh, some of the other things that as we go through this, once again, I've been talking about you know, the Department of Public Health folks. You better be aware of what your local Department of Health has for guidelines. I've sat in on uh, now four towns that have had uh, meetings with all of the youth sport providers that was their parks and rec and their and their local department of health had meetings for everybody that provides youth sports and i can tell you this that some towns may be more restrictive than the state so you better be aware of that before we start soccer activities better be aware of that Everybody, for the most part, should have a relationship with folks at the town, especially parks and rec or the school, school committees or the such, so you know, where they get their permits. So reestablish your communications, get the dialogue going so you can, uh, you can learn a little bit more. Um, another thing I'm just gonna point out real quick is that all participants have to arrive with their own water bottle, towel, personal hygiene product, soccer ball, uh, PPE. Uh, there's no sharing of anything. And so as you read through this, you'll understand uh, some of the, the, the policies for arrival and departure. And we'll, once again, we'll touch on that uh, mostly through any Q&A we have, but it's all internal here in this document. Face coverings. Uh, before I move on, I, I just want to talk about face coverings. <clears throat> we have seen an awful lot of creative face coverings uh, being used. And so uh, while phase two is taking place, as long as players maintain their six foot separation from each other, they do not need to wear a face mask or a face covering. However, if a parent would like their child to wear a mask or a face covering, then that's permissible. There's no contact, they're six feet away. There's no danger of having uh, a finger stuck in somebody else's you know, covering uh, that could cause injury. From a coach's perspective, uh, 
<clears throat> highly recommend that the coach wears a face covering as much as possible. Um, they could do, if they find that it's difficult to, uh, to vocalize instructions, got to remember, you've got 10 kids in a small space, you're not yelling anymore. You're not yelling to some child 70 feet away in the far corner of the field. They're going to be around you. So, uh, you know, your uh, normal voice could, could be used, but if you find the face covering to be muffling you as you're providing instruction, you can just make sure you're six feet away from everybody, pull it down, verbalize, and then pull it back up. As easy as that. All right. Um, before talking about face coverings, and then I'm going to move on to eventually when phase three starts, where games should be able to be played, and had a discussion with our referee community last night about face coverings as well, is that when games start, um, the referee is going to take a look at a, a child and it comes down to uh, basically uh, dangerous equipment. If a referee feels that something is dangerous, they won't permit it to be played with. For example, in the past, we've had kids wear a, a bandana as a headscarf and it's got a big knot in the back. And if a ball were to hit that knot, that becomes dangerous. That head, the headscarf with a knot becomes dangerous equipment. So now you could figure, okay, well, what kind of face coverings could be considered dangerous? Our view is that any face covering that wraps around the neck, wraps around the head in totality and it's tied off, or those, those neck gaiters, which I have one that you wear around the neck and then you can pull up like Jesse James, um, you know, those neck gaiters, that's dangerous equipment because when play starts, if uh, kids go up for a head ball or, they get close, somebody falls into somebody else, they can get a finger or a hand or something caught in that and it won't come off. So pretty much the only face covering that will be safe for a child to play in, if in fact the parent would like their child to continue wearing one, is the kind that goes around and over the ears. The standard blue $1 or $1.25 face mask that's available out there now that they can just put on, goes around the ears uh, and so it can pop off or even a homemade one that we all see the cloth with the elastic that go over the years, that if anything were to come in contact with it, a hand uh, or something or a finger, uh, that it could pop off. That uh, should not be considered dangerous equipment. And it's being worn for health reasons as well. So there's, uh, there's, there's a little bit more flexibility for our referees to understand that. Phase three. Uh, Phase three, I'll just touch on it, is that we really, really hope uh, and, and we believe that phase three will include games, okay? But that's yet to be determined. Uh, you know, is it going to be 20 people to us playing surface, which means all games will be 77 until we can get to 11 v 11, or is it going to be 25, or is it going to be 50? We're looking at what many other states are going through right now as to what their incrementals are, because we know our governor is talking with all of our neighboring states in New England, as well as uh, the other states all around the country, they're, they're comparing notes. So we're not sure, where, but we believe it will include games. Folks, don't expect tournaments, or if there are tournaments, they could be restricted to a travel distance or nobody from out of state or something along those lines. Uh, but you know, what we're looking for is the ability to, to play some games and your uh, technical department under Ian's uh, uh, guidance is putting together uh, content as we speak for not only phase two uh, as well as phase three to see if we can do some game scheduling or we can help towns schedule friendlies against each other during the summer months if that's something that they desire to do. We have, we have heard a lot of people have a, a desire to have a lot of our uh, U14 or grade eight teams uh, get some activities in this summer before they head to tryouts for high school uh, the end of August. Plus it would be the last time that they will probably play together as a team. Thus, uh, we're gonna do everything possible to see if we can coordinate these activities at the Massey Soccer Fields where the fields will be available uh, and it'll be basically some small administrative and referee fees only, no field rental fees. So we're, we're taking a look at getting as much summer activities going 
and district select program, if we can have games, we will have a modified version of district select program up and running if in fact games are permitted. We just won't have the season ending tournament, but that's, uh, that's on the docket for phase three. Phase four, uh, the governor says, is re to return to the new normal. Folks, the new normal is gonna be everything that we do every day. Wash our hands, use sanitizer, put on our face mask, six feet away from everybody, fist bump, no hugs and kisses, waves hello, and too many Zoom meetings for work. But uh, we will, when we get there, from a sports perspective, it should be full resum resumption of outdoor activities and sports. Still possibly the phase four may have various steps. Just the way phase two has various steps for restaurants, phase four could have various steps or phase three could have various steps for youth sports. The rest of the document I'm just gonna go through is stuff that facilities need to be aware of, okay? You can read this on your own. This is primarily for facility owners. This is for parks and rec, this is for the schools, this is for uh, organizations that may uh, have exclusive use of their own facility. So this is pretty much for facility uh, users. Uh, and please read this and go through this. If you have any questions about any of this, definitely uh, share those during the Q&A. Uh, it, it, it continues with the facilities. Uh, really, if anything else, you know, when, you know, as you show up and you play the game, Let's just make sure that we're aware of, of these, these guidelines. And uh, once again, it's pretty simple to understand. There really is that, not that much of a burden. Uh, it's just things that we need to be aware of. Um, towns and organizations. This is for those that are on this journey here of the towns and organizations. Go through your bullets here. Uh, you know, there's the, the criteria if somebody uh, is, uh, it's communicated if, uh, you know, back to you that you have a player that's a con a confirmed case of COVID. Um, you have to report that to the health department right away because then it will go into the tracing process. Um, you know, if you have a, a team members or a coach that have contracted COVID, uh, they're going to basically have to quarantine for, for, for 14 days. And anybody that was associated with them is to cancel uh, everything for that team and they'll, they'll go into a quarantine for 14 days. If you really have a, a, a dr dramatic um, you know, uptick of cases in the town or the such, the town may shut you down before you decide to shut anything down. And uh, wait a two week period, wait for whatever uh, is, is working its way through that community, works its way through, and then pick up things at that point based on what the town decides that, that you can do. But be prepared to shut down operations uh, if need be. Um, once again, a lot of this is some, uh, it's just repetitive from one list to the next, depending on who we're talking about. Here's our coaches uh, information that Ian will spend more time on going through this when he goes through his coaches toolkit. Once again, I'm not gonna stay and read this to you. I'll let you guys and gals uh, read this on your own. Parents list. I just wanna point out, we're asking parents to be the first line of defense, to take their children's temperature to keep an eye on the children's health before they let them participate. Yes, there's a lot of trust involved here, but I think the way things are taking place these days, I, I really believe, and I'm really, really proud of our, you know, the parents that are out there are saying, listen, I've got to play a role in this. You know, I'm not going to let my child go play because I want to get them out of the house if they're running a fever. They're going to take a look at the bigger picture, and, and we truly believe that we'll have uh, people taking this seriously and not letting their children get involved if they're showing any symptoms or signs whatsoever. Um, parents, we're going to ask during phase three, phase two, uh, if your program is participating, when you bring your child, no carpooling, you, you arrive uh, with your child, face mask on. If you want to wear gloves, that's perfectly fine. Bring your hand sanitizer. Single file, Marching in, get your child to the team, the coach will have a place for them, and then parents, you have to be six feet apart. They're asking during this phase that only one parent or chaperone or guardian uh, comes with a child. Now we understand that some parents may not have coverage for other children. So we might have a parent there with one, two, or three other kids while one of the kids is playing. 
that's fine. It's basically using what they're doing at the beach. Those, that family can sit together in a group as long as you're six feet away from the closest person in the next group. And they're allowed to sit there as a family unit. Uh, and they don't have to wear their face mask if it's a family unit, but they do have to wear it the second they get up and move out of their space because they will be closer than six feet to other people. And so thus they must put their face mask on. So arrive with the mask, sit down, you can take it off, but the second you get up, you must wear the mask. And then when you leave, you'll go assist your child, and uh, Ian will touch a little bit more about that. Uh, information for players, a lot of it is uh, pretty much simple. Make sure that they practice hygiene. By now, kids, I think, are, are, have gotten the system down pretty good. Um, they should arrive with their own hand sanitizer uh, whenever possible. If not, coaches should have a, have a supply to, to give a, each child a spray or a squirt of, uh, of sanitizer. Definitely have face coverings on arrival and ending. And if you want, they can wear it during practice. That's your choice as a parent. Um, and no sharing of equipment, no sharing of water bottles, no high fives, fist bumps, hugs, I miss you, and all that stuff. For this phase, we just got to keep that distance. And then uh, tournament director's event, when allowed by the state, is a bunch of information here. I'm going to slide by that. And then lastly is uh, at the end of the document here, if you look at it online, all of these, uh, these, these resources are hyperlinked. And the one I really invite you to take a look at, I'm not gonna go to it right now, but is the US Soccer Play On. Um, there's a Play On pledge. It's a great idea for organizations to possibly adopt that. So we definitely uh, you know, invite you to take a look at that. And then also in the US uh, Soccer Recognized to Recover, there's a section on COVID-19 and mental health. Some great information there uh, to share as you start to address some of the the concerns that we'll have as as children return so there's the guidelines uh as as we have them uh i blew through them but you know stuff that you'll be able to definitely please read it in the search or if you have we'll get your questions we know that uh, the webinar is taking place now and then uh the member organization checklist Real quickly, I'm going to go through this. So everything that we went through in the guidelines, what we did was we kind of uh, used a, created a Cliff Notes version of a checklist that you can just quickly go through as an organization to say, are we ready or is this team ready? And so we've got, you know, a checklist for requirements prior to commencing soccer activities. And this is for the organization leadership. So make sure that you've, uh, your guidelines are, are posted and emailed out. Point to our website from your website. Appoint your COVID officer. Communicate your policies and guidelines to your coaching staff. Make sure all coaches that are conducting practices are fully registered, stuff we went over and you would do anyway. You know, work with each coach to identify a COVID-19 coordinator to oversee compliance at the team level. It can be a team parent but they need to be registered as an adult with Mass Youth Soccer. Their primary role is as the coach is working with the 10 kids out on the field or the kids in two quadrants, is um, it's a good idea to have another parent, number one. You know, they may be, become the least liked person, but is to make sure everybody is prop practicing on the parent side, physical distancing, wearing PPE, doing what they're supposed to be doing this could the coordinator may end up being the coach which is the coach is responsible for their team and their parents behavior that's just that's the sport so uh but if you can get a, about another team parent to help out that would be that would be great um and we we have a lot of healthcare professionals that uh may be willing to help out but then again they may be willing to watch their child play soccer and take their mind off everything that they've been doing for 20 hours a day since this all started. Uh, once again, if you're using public fields, make sure that, you, uh, that you know, you're properly uh, trained on and equipped to use sanitizer. If you're using private fields, the private owner uh, has to have developed, you know, as we had in our facility owners uh, information. And make hand sanitizer, wipes, soda, soap and water, 
uh, readily available throughout the facility if you're using any, any type of facility. While conducting soccer activities, the quick checklist here, just make sure everybody's the, you know, in equipment, they're not sharing anything, there's physical distancing, the coach is the only one touching the cones, um, you know, that during water breaks, they maintain physical distancing, no sharing, and the coach should take proper attendance for each session and record on paper or electronically at each session, because in the event something does take place, we wanna be uh, making sure that we are demonstrating that we, we are a part of the tracing process here in the state of Massachusetts. And then after conducting the session, a quick checklist once again, you know, as an organization, you may early have board members out watching and, 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 and guiding people through the process and reminding them, you know, pick up your trash. We don't want, uh, you know, if it's, if, if everybody should be responsible for their own trash. Coach is the only one who touches equipment, his cones and other equipment. And, uh, packs it up and, and away we go. So those are the guidelines that we put together for everybody that, you should, you know, that we could take, take a look at. So as I scroll down after that, we've got right here, this is where the, uh, the COVID uh, safety officer is gonna submit their agreement to be a COVID safety officer. It's just one of our typical forms that is filled out. And uh, so please, uh, identify your COVID safety officers for all of your organizations. And now it's time for me to take a little break and we're gonna have uh, Mr. Ian Moliner introduce you to the coaches toolkit. Ian, it's all yours. Thank you, Mike. And welcome to everybody and thank you for taking the time to attend our Return to Activities webinar. We really appreciate it. At this point, I'd like to say something crazy like, uh, stop me if you've heard this before, but the likelihood is I wouldn't get through actually my part of the little webinar here. So the coach's toolkit, what is it? Well, we'll tell you what it is. We believe that we've put together, we've provided for you a great checklist that guides you from before you even get back together or just about thinking about getting back together right until after the first in-person soccer activity is concluded and everything in between. And, and by everything, I truly mean everything. And while this may appear to be a lot of responsibilities, uh, trust me when I say we, we truly are all, we're pretty much going through this in phase one in the stay at home advisory and we've got a lot of these things already in place that we do on a daily basis and certainly every time we leave the house. So uh, without further ado let's go through the uh, checklist. I'm not going to do an exhaustive, you may be exhausted already, but I'm not going to do an exhaustive run through. I'm just going to provide you some highlights and an overview for reasons that will be revealed as I get towards the end of my little piece here for the coaches. So for the, before we even step onto the field as coaches, there's something that we need to do. We need to not only read it, read it again, and then reread it, but we need to be able to understand and understand how to apply the guidelines once we get out there on the field in an actual soccer practice with the players. So it's a case of understand and apply for the guidelines. It's critical that we do that. And as Mike's already attested to, make sure that you're registered through us for the Massive Soccer platform. And please don't just show up at a field. Make sure that you've confirmed the field use permissions are already in place. All right, so moving on to prior to the first practice. We suggest, and we've already created them for you, we suggest that you either compose your own or you can use our sample emails to send to your team parents just to gauge their level of interest and you know who's looking to get their child back out onto the soccer field. And during that, what we're suggesting is to provide an overview of the practice session. And if you can, if you've already gone to our website and looked at our physical distancing training session plans, maybe you send them a link to that training session plan that you're going to use. So they have an idea, they can review it in their own time. So they have an idea of what the practice is actually going to look and feel like once they actually take off to the fields. So strongly advise you to uh, include that link in your email. 
and also explain within that email that you will want to be set up either a virtual meeting similar to this if you've got that availability or if you don't have this availability that you'll be setting up a, a phone call or a conference call with the parents where you will be reviewing the return to soccer activities guidelines that's that's really very very important um so moving on a lot mike to be parent communication So in terms of the parent communication, there was a question in, in the Q&A earlier about uh, is there any information in here for parents? Most of the information that you're going to receive as a parent, is I assume, is going to come from the coaches, but let's not live on assumptions. Let's make sure we're going in and checking the guidelines for ourselves. I mean, I'm a soccer parent as, as, as we speak. So uh, make sure that we're going in and taking care of that. Don't just rely on the coach to provide all of it. But as the coach, we, we are beholden to, as I said, not only read, understand, but be able to apply all of the guidelines once we get to practice. And if we scroll down a little bit further here, we've just got a, a diagram of what a potential field setup is going to look like. As you can see, each of the players be, have been assigned their own grid. Uh, the physically distance, it may not look that way on this training session plan that you're looking at in front of you, but I assure you we've got all the measurements in place on all of our training session plans. And then if you have a look at the shaded areas on the outside, we've already got their predetermined and pre-assigned player equipment and waiting zones set up so that we are really trying to minimize anybody's ability to get closer than the recommended physical distancing. Thank you, if we can move on. So now as the coach, prior to arrival at the practice, check and recheck that you've got all of the personal protection equipment that you can possibly get your hands on and all of the cleaning supplies so that you can safely disinfect anything that needs to be disinfected and sanitized once you get to the practice session. Make sure that all of the soccer equipment that you're planning to use that day has been sanitized and then pack it up into your car. Before you get into your car though, have another look at that training session plan and make sure that you are crystal clear on how the field is going to look and how you're gonna set it up once you arrive at the location. Uh, and in here, we've got our physical distancing. There's a link right in the coach's toolkit. It takes you to our physical distancing training plans. And as you can see there, we've got the players separated in little grids with spaces in between to ensure that there is physical distancing taking place. Thank you. If we could go back. That's great. The last thing I would say is, uh, in terms of pre-practice, is make sure, not that you haven't tried to do this, and we all know how life gets, but let's make sure, certainly in the short term while we're in this phase two, that we're always the first to arrive at practice so we can get all of this set up before anybody else arrives. Because once people start arriving, we all know how that is, and we do need to be cognizant there's going to be a certain amount of management that we're going to do, we're going to have to do as coaches for our players and in some cases our parents. So on arrival at the field, let's make sure that we've got the training session area all stopped and combed out with all of the grids, all of the waiting areas and, and the break areas. And, and, and if we need to, let's just remind the, player, uh, the parents politely Please don't hang about, don't linger, uh, certainly not out of your vehicle in the parking lot. You know, you, you're welcome to stay at the practice, but, you know, it'd be preferred if you, uh, if you don't mind, if you can stand it to stay in your car for the foreseeable future. If you feel as though you have to get out, I would just follow the guidelines that Mike laid earlier, follow the physical distancing and the personal protective equipment guidelines that Mike alluded to earlier. Uh, we just scroll up a little bit. So as the players arrive at the practice, what we're suggesting is that you greet the players and you inquire about the health. As Mike said, we don't want you making any records. It's just a well-being check. It's just making sure that nobody's arriving that's feeling as well as they could be. 
Uh, so just doing a, a check there uh, and then assign them to the respective waiting area and, you know, have them understand that, you know, this is now going to be part of our new normal uh, and maybe even making this a routine for your team. So creating team routines throughout all of this where we arrive at practice five minutes beforehand, we get assigned to our designated area. Uh, and children really appreciate the uh, idea and, and going through routines as it instills a sense of normalcy, as, I, as I've just alluded to. And it helps them to feel a bit more safe and comfortable because everybody is following the same procedures. And, and that routine, in some cases, you could, you could turn into uh, a bit of a fun thing if you're so inclined. During the practice. So during the practice now, we're going to talk about the entry and exit procedures that players need to follow here to the physical distancing. Again, this is another opportunity for you as the coach to create a routine, whatever that routine looks like in your world. You know, maybe it's the first uh, grid in line and then you, you, you filter everybody through, marching behind each other. Oh, I'm not trying to get some military connotations here because we've been trying to get away from that for years. So, you know, just keeping it fun, though. It's a, it's a routine, and we need to make sure that you know, while, we, while we're adhering, adhering to the safe and, safety and health guidelines, that, you know, it doesn't not need to be fun because of that. So, again, the physical distancing, very important. Then for you as the coach, it's a case of stepping back and just observing and monitoring the player's behavior. They've been away from each other for quite some time. I'm sure they'll want to get closer than we'd really like them to get to. It, it, it's upon us as coaches to restrict them from that, certainly during this phase two period. And, and that is part of our role and responsibility as a coach that, that we need to be able to do that. So it's the physical distancing. And then if there's some inadvertent touching of a soccer ball by the hand, by anybody's hands during the, so during the soccer practice, including your own, then it's up to you to remove that ball from the session, wipe it down with any sort of disinfect you have, and then return it to players by using your feet only. So wipe it down then kick it back into play and get the players active again by getting the ball back in play that way. As Mike said, in terms of face coverings and masks, what we're advising is that you wear a mask throughout the entire practice session and really only pull it down or remove it if you've got coaching inf information that you want to pass on to your players or something that, some information that can only be delivered verbally. Uh, and then the final thing for during practice, uh, and again, it's, it's more of an overview of this than a step-by-step -step in, in the particular checklist, is just anybody that uh, creates trash, the person that creates the trash, empty water bottle, uh, snack bag, something, something like that, that those, the people that create the trash are, are responsible for disposing of their own trash. It should not be held upon anybody else to pick that up and, and dispose of it in the appropriate receptacle on their behalf. Uh, and, and then we're going to come to, as you know, we've got through the practice, everything's gone quite well. We've managed to maintain the physical distancing. Players have enjoyed themselves we hope, but now let's, let's find out at the practice dismissal. Let's thank the players for their attendance, praise them for their efforts, and then let's ask them, ask them a few questions to see what their takeaways are from the day. So you can get a read on whether the children enjoyed the session, understood what the session was trying to teach them, but just you know, engage them in some kind of conversation because they've been missing that for months now. Uh, again, all the while maintaining physical distancing and following the guidelines and procedures. As the players exit the field and are about to return to the parents and the vehicles and the guardians, make sure that they are adhering to the physical distancing once again. Make sure that they are wearing the necessary protective equipment. And then just a reminder, make sure that all of you, that the equipment that you've used today and all of the clothing, clothing that you've worn during the practice, make sure that that's laundered as soon as they arrive home. So I apologize 
for that parents I've just uh, added to your lot there but uh, it, it is obviously a critical piece to make sure that we're we're getting rid of any potential uh, virus here uh, and then finally it's just a case of making sure that every child is picked up again remind the parents not to linger in the parking lot or to congregate there for any extended period of time and then it's incumbent on us as the coach to be the last person to leave to make sure that the area is left safe uh, and then you can return home uh, and and now we've got another set of procedures for you to follow because it's not over when you think it's over anymore once you get home as soon as you get home open up the trunk pull out all of the soccer equipment that you've used that day and make sure that you clean and disinfect it make that a habit Apparently, if you do it for 21 days, it'll become automatic. We'll see. Um, any clothing that you've worn during the session needs to be laundered. Uh, and then send an email while it's fresh. Send an email to the parents thanking them for the child's attendance and reminding them that if the child becomes ill, that they are to notify you and you alone and that you can take the necessary steps to resolve the issue with your local public health department don't take it on yourself take the appropriate steps with the appropriate people to make sure that you're following local uh, public health guidelines and procedures and then finally the and, last page and just Can jumping in quickly because we're, we're getting a lot of questions regarding um sharing of soccer balls um so while players aren't permitted to share equipment is it permissible yep. for players to pass the ball back and forth while social distancing, so long as no players touch the ball with their hands. Well, and that's going to be the key. Uh, and it could be the most challenging aspect for the coach is, you know, you've got a group of eight players, you know, they're in pairs and they're passing the ball back and forth, uh, just making sure that nobody is actually touching the balls with their hands. Because that's the thing, if some, if you see a player, you know, and it's, it's on the honesty policy and my, uh, my history with children is that generally they'll be more honest than not. Um, and they'll tell you, look, hey, so-and-so's touched the ball and, and, and take it out of the session and clean it down. But from everything that we understand, the, the virus isn't generally transmitted from somebody passing a soccer ball with only the feet to another person with only the feet, Those, that player receiving it and then passing back. So... I, th I think we'll be all that, right in pairs. What's that? Going on to that? Goalkeepers can goalkeepers um, be incorporated into training with the use of goalkeeper gloves? Oh, um, I'm, I'm going to say I, I'm going to say I think so, but I'm going to have to uh, I'm going to have to look into that further. So the um, that question has come up. It, so. Essentially, is that if a goal, if a child is wearing, you know, keeper gloves, and got to remember, yeah. we're just talking about phase two right now. Yeah. And goalkeeper practice is not going to be an essential part of what we're going through. Is let's right. try and keep it to field practices. But at the older ages, yes, if in fact you do have a, somebody who's going to be a goalkeeper, is as a coach that they put their gloves on. You can spray them with a with a disinfectant spray, yeah. and wipe them down. But the second that goalkeeper goes like this, that's it. Time out. You got to go yeah. check the glove again and then get him back in, 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 into play. Okay, the other part about that also is there's a concern with goalkeeper training that the ball is going to be caught and it's just underneath their face, very, very close to where they can mm -hmm. and, and and droplets. So our recommendation is that for this uh, two to three week period that we're coming up on in phase two, there's absolutely zero need for keeper training. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, they're, they're great points. They really are because it's it's not the gloves themselves which can of course be sanitized, if you can ever sanitize a pair of goalkeeper gloves for anybody that's ever worn yeah. a pair. But yeah, um, but they can be sanitized on the externally. But then it's everything else that goes with it, as Mike was saying, you know, wiping off sweat, catching the ball close to the face. Uh, maybe, maybe we think of it in a different way. Maybe we think about this is a good time to teach the goalkeepers to learn to be a little bit better with the feet. You know, um, it's, it, it should, if everything goes according to our best wishes and your best wishes and the plan, this, this phase two period shouldn't last, you know, much through the end of June, I'm going to say that bold statement, but uh, 
I, I wouldn't really go further than that at this point. Uh, and then we come up to the last page in our coaches checklist here. Uh, and what we've got is all of the recommended um, cleaning, disinfectant supply and personal protective equipment. We've got links to our physical distancing training session plans. And we've got all of the resources that were, is also in the main guidelines document. So uh, again, I, I would urge you to click on any of those links. Uh, and the final thing that I'd like to say is uh, we will be going through the coaches toolkit tomorrow evening for all of the uh, directors of soccer development from all of the organizations. If your director of soccer development has not received an email from our technical department, please email me tonight. We'll get them the invite to that meeting for tomorrow. We'll be going, we'll actually be pulling out a training session plan tomorrow and taking them right the way through what a training session is going to look like just with them on the field. Thank you for listening. Uh, and Mike, back to you. Mike, you're muted. Most people pray for that. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, as we uh, move move along, the questions as to be coming in. Rob uh, Holiday has been grabbing them, cutting and pasting them into a master document, of which then he's going to be uh, reading the the questions in the order, uh, or he's memorizing them all. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, we'll get through the Q&A as they've been coming in, and Ian and I will handle those uh, as, as we go through things. Um, just a couple of things that I've been getting a lot of the emails on leading up to today, so I'm, I'm going to anticipate some questions here, see if I can address them. One is, uh, uh, first off, thank you very much for staying with us through the guidelines, going through the web page, and now we're going to get into some, some other information in the Q&A. Camps and clinics. Okay. Uh, for those of you that typically have run a camp or have somebody run a soccer camp, uh, the camps have a whole set of guidelines and policies and rules from the Department of Public Health that they must follow. Uh, I got to believe that most organizations when it comes to summer camps have an outside provider run the summer camp. Because if you do run your summer camps, then you're probably inf uh, you know, intimately aware of the, uh, the Department of Public Health 105 CMR 430 minimum standards for recreational camps for children. Um, these are everything that you got to you know, do in order to run a summer camp. You know, summer camps operate on site for more than two hours, but not less than 24. They're four, more than four days a week. So we have, there's a lot of camp providers out there. They take care of this. They've got to make sure that everybody's background checked. They've got to make sure that all their counselors are immunized. They've got to report into the Department of Public Health and so on. Folks, I'm not sure how many summer camps we will be seeing. So the alternative will be clinics. And let me just share with you, if you run a clinic, and a clinic is less than two hours a day, you know, for, for a child, and so up to two hours, they can, they can report to a clinic, you know, three days in a row or four days in a row, as long as it's less than two hours. Um, it, it maintains the definition of a clinic. But you could have a clinic, it could look like a clinic, run like a clinic, act like a clinic, but if the word camp is used in any literature whatsoever, it automatically becomes a camp. So if you're not in the camp business, Forget the word camp, never use it again. Clinics, you run, you'll run soccer summer clinics. So if you run clinics, what, we're, what we have is uh, the technical department is gonna have packages that are available real soon up on our website uh, for when phase, you know, phase three starts, because right now we're just doing practices at 10, but we're talking more summer clinics. They're gonna basically have a you know, clinic in a can. It's going to have uh, the outlines, the materials, the, the, the lesson plans, everything that you'll need to run a summer clinic. So that'll be coming from the technical department. And you don't have to go through all the rigmarole for, for a clinic. Now keep this in mind, if you run any clinics this, um, if you run any clinics this summer, in your program, in order for it to be covered by Master Soccer's insurance coverage for running the clinic, 
all participants must be affiliated and registered with Mass Youth Soccer. So if you decide to run anything for U15s or higher or high school age or higher, it's highly likely that you submitted that data to us or we, you, you did and we refund it. But if you're gonna run it, you have got to get those kids registered with Mass Youth Soccer to be covered under the Mass Youth Soccer uh, insurance program in order for that uh, clinic to be, to, to be run. So that's just one of the things. So you, you know, and, and if you're gonna do that, just simply get the registrations, send up the, the information as you would with a typical upload, a player upload uh, during a regular season. We get it and you're off and running. But you must make sure that anybody participating is registered and affiliated. Before I move away from clinics or camps, Rob, anything to add to that at all? Were there any other questions? Okay. Uh, nothing with Iron Clinics or camps. Right. Next the question was about uh, information about insurance. A lot of people are wondering, okay, what is covered here? What is or isn't covered? Uh, as long as the organizations are in good standing and all participants are in good standing, registered, affiliate, and affiliated, and paid, uh, they're covered by the Master Soccer Insurance Program. Last year, we uh, took the position that we extended the, the, the coverage for our members year round. So is, if you're running summer activities uh, or, or activities that you know, aren't part of your regular season or the such, as long as the organization's in good, in good shape, all your adults are registered that are participating, all the players are registered that are participating, our insurance coverage will take care of you for your training sessions, your clinics, your specialty sessions, whatever you want, you want to call them. If you are using you know, somebody else's fields, which most of you are, just make sure that if they require a COI that you get that certificate of insurance uh, you know, submitted for and, and in place, that's important. Now, when it comes to insurance policies there, is that our excess medical policy is actually an excess accident policy. It's been that way for years. It does not cover illness. COVID-19 is an illness, triple E is an illness, measles, mumps is an illness, Lyme disease is an illness, they're not accidents. Accidents are something that happens while a child or a coach is participating in soccer activities. So our excess medical policy uh, will not cover illnesses and it never has. Now the next question is, well, what if somebody contracts, uh, you know, and comes down with COVID-19, well, what's going to happen is they're going to family will take care of that child or that adult. They're going to do everything that they need to do: go to the hospital, you know, work with their insurance carriers and the such. If the family decides that they would like to take legal action to try and recover expenses, then they would basically try to identify where it was contracted and take that action. If they feel that it took place on a soccer field at one of our you know, member ev events, then they would sue Mass Youth Soccer. And that is why we have a general and excess liability uh, insurance that ranges anywhere from uh, 10 to $12 million worth of coverage. And that's in, that's in place. I'm not going to go into the legalities of all that stuff because that's for the insurance carrier and the lawyers to figure out. But really what it comes down to is, um, you know, if it can be, you know, sourced back that the actual place that they contracted was at a soccer event, that's for the insurance company and the lawyers to work on, not us to worry about. Okay. Um, so one thing that we have put in place, uh, to help deal with that is that we have updated our, our, our waivers. So uh, this was hot off the press today. Um, we're putting this into the stack uh, U.S. Soccer Connect system. So as adults start to register for this fall, um, this language is going to be in there. And then what we're going to ask is that all uh, players, let me... Um, get to my web page here. I'm gonna go back to our website. Under administration, uh, for those of you that may not be aware of this, uh, under administration, 
go to the section member toolkit. This was just created recently, and this is a toolkit that we have for all of our member organizations having to do with governing principles, notice to organizations, documents, resources, and everything about governance that you were afraid to ask. Uh, and it's, it's tools and information. On this page, and it was just updated today, is the Master Soccer Player Registration Waiver Information. This has been available for the last four and a half years. Uh, we've gotten it out to almost every registration vendor uh, for them to put into their system. Uh, so no matter, you know, if, whatever registration system you're using, you're going to want to go and grab this information. Now, here's the player re uh, release. Grab this, send it to them. They'll put it into their registration system so when a parent registers their child, they will be signing off on this. So the new paragraph pretty much is this paragraph right here. The risk of injury and illness from activities involved in the program is significant. And it talks about communicable uh, uh, diseases and calling out COVID. And it's the consent taking on, you know, the you know, releasing and indemnifying and so all that, that fun stuff. So that language is there. Um, for those of you that may be you know, still using paper version, you know, it's there, but grab this, give it to the vendor, or if you have your own homegrown registration system, this has got to be put in the registration language that is used for, for agreements and waivers uh, when somebody registers their child. And then we also have the same for adults, adult participation release of liability. So uh, we just had our, our, our attorneys work on this for us. The, the primary source of this comes from US Youth Soccer, secondary source comes from the insurance carrier, and then the third source was the, uh, was the application of, of information from our attorneys. So it's all ready to go. And that was just, uh, just updated today. And then lastly on my list before we get to Q&A was uh, people had some questions about, uh, about PPE. Uh, so currently for mass purchases, it's been essential businesses only. However, more and more uh, businesses are, are dual purposing themselves and, and providing sanit, uh, you know, uh, sanitization product. Uh, gels, liquid, masks, gloves, and the such. Uh, as the time goes on, I think more of everybody will start to see that a lot of this is now definitely more readily available. Um, the manufacturers now, I mean, I've been into some Walmarts, I've been in some Walgreens, I've been in some CVSs. It's more readily available. Prices have dropped it's, uh, and, and it's, it's out there. We're taking a look at Master Soccer as possibly doing a bulk purchase, but the problem is that when we do a bulk pur purchase and then we want to get it out to our members, we've got 330 members that we got to dr basically drop ship to. And then all of a sudden you've got shipping and handling and all the postage costs it kind of drives up the price to, to what you can possibly work with a local business. Uh, in the information on the toolkit are links to um, providers of PPE. And so you'll be able to go to those links, find a local business that you can work with and, uh, and, and put some purchases in. What we have found is in other parts of the state as country, States that opened two, three weeks ago, uh, Idaho, Utah, Arizona, Florida, that, that have had kids playing, is that uh, what a lot of people have done is they've gone to local businesses that are starting to make their own product, and uh, the businesses have been donating a fair amount of PPE to the youth sports in, in their organization. So why don't you try as much as possible to, uh, to either go to local businesses that might be in your, in your zip code, uh, in, in your area, and, and if not, is to uh, you know talk to your members because if you put it out there, I, it, it's highly likely somebody in your organization as a parent has a connection, which they could get somebody to make a donation of product. Uh, what Master Soccer will be doing to help you get kickstarted is that we will uh, we put an order in with a company down Route Two in Gardner. Uh, they've started the process of manufacturing four ounce spray bottles for us. 
and that um, we're going to be getting these to every league um, office, uh, you know, for the town-based leagues, CCLE, NECSL, as well as um, the futsal leagues. And then for those organizations that aren't a part of a league where you're just a house organization, we'll contact you. But we're going to provide everybody with basically a Kickstarter supply as this is manufactured. We'll deliver it to one person at the league, of which then other people can come and pick up. And it'll be one four ounce bottle for every 12 kids registered in your organization. So some towns might be getting 80 bottles. And we'll be, uh, they're, they're starting to manufacture the first 3,000 right now. And, uh, and we'll have enough to go around the state to give everybody a kickstart with PPE. And at the same time, we're gonna start to see if we can work on bulk buying purchasing uh, that still makes it beneficial even with additional charges for ship for shipping, if it looks like we can get our hands on on masks at fifty percent of what other people would get, because we could get a ton of them, we'll have them shipped to the office. And just the same way that you uh, you order pass cards or lanyards, uh, we'll have you basically order uh, at cost and, and and pay for shipping uh, to to Lancaster, and we'll ship it out to everybody if we need to do that. Our gut tells us by the time summer rolls around, uh, the availability of PPE will not be an issue. And that's what we're looking for. That's it for my prepared stuff, Rob. So let the questions roll in. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start with uh, a couple that are related to uh, what you just discussed. First one was from Paul Almeida um, in regards to the COVID safety officer. Um, if there are violations, um, what liability does that COVID uh, safety officer put themselves under? So uh, the, the, the first the question is, what is a violation? Um, so uh, violation is is interesting uh, word. I mean, it's it's you're all self managing and self governing yourselves. It's the same way you're pretty much self governing yourselves that you're making sure that every adult that steps onto a field has a credential. Uh, that that they go through the background checks. It's the same same way you self govern. That every player that's playing is properly registered, and you're just not letting walk on, walk ins take place. So it's a matter of self uh, self monitoring. The COVID officer um, doesn't have any additional liability uh, put on them any more than the quarry uh, submitter and risk manager does. They're they're performing a function on behalf of Mass U Soccer. If anything does happen, they're under the Mass Youth Soccer $10 million liability policy, and they'll be they'll and, and directors and officers insurance, they'll they'll be all set. So I uh, I hope that it addresses your concerns. Um, the next one was from Josh Cormier regarding the PPE um, and hand sanitizer. Um, is there going to be an expectation if we provide them uh, initially? to our players, parents, coaches, that we will have to continue to provide them as organizations. And if we're unable to provide them, um, do we put ourselves under any significant liability? So uh, the first off is the Department of Public Health for the state of Massachusetts is requiring this. They are requiring that, uh, and you saw the guidelines, a lot of that comes directly from the state's guidelines, is that an organizer is responsible for making sure that there is PPE available for participants in that organization. Now the state uses the word organizer. Organizer could be uh, club leadership, it could be the coach. Um, so it is, uh, it is each club's responsibility, each town and club's responsibility to make sure that their coaching staff has product. Now, if a player shows up and doesn't have any, you know, any uh, gel or, or you know, sanitization liquid or, or the such, well, the coach needs to have it where the player, coach puts his mask up, player comes over, a squirt or a spray on their hands, and away they go. You have to realize is that players can be within, off the field, within six feet of somebody as long as they have a mask on. But the second the mask comes off, it's the separation. So, but please don't think that you can run a practice that all the players and the coach are wearing a mask so they can get close to each other. That's not the case. On the field, it's six feet, mask on or mask off. Off the field, mask on at all times when within six feet. 
So, uh, so uh, you know, it, but getting back to your question, it's the responsibility of the organization to make sure that, that materials are, are available. If it's a problem of not being able to acquire or whatever, let us know. Uh, we've got resources. Um, you know, there, as I said, it's showing up in the stores more readily. Um, you, you, there's, there's, you know, we're going to have a resource list. We, well, it's on the website, a place you can call and, and get it readily available. Um, an important one from Cara Stafford. If someone on my team gets ill and tests positive for COVID, what process do I follow? Okay. So um, first off, you know, if they test positive for COVID, it's going to be a parent notifying the coach, most likely. And if they, uh, if the parent says, listen, I've got a child or, or myself for that matter, the parent uh, test positive, they're going to notify the coach. The coach first needs to notify the club right away. Okay, notify the club. Next thing they're going to do is need to notify the local Department of Health right away. Local Department of Health is going to give you guidance on what needs to be done with that. You know, with, with it. they're going to they're, they're going to gather information. They're going to start the tracing process, which is why you need to keep uh, a log of who who was attending a practice. There's uh, several states that are out there that, even though we say that these groups of ten, you know, it's one coach and nine players that that uh, you know are together for a practice that on a Tuesday, and then it could be. The coach mixes it up and it's a different group on Thursday. Some states are asking the organizations, keep it contiguous all throughout this phase. If you're able to keep it contiguous throughout this phase, it makes tracing so much easier uh, to, to manage. So um, that's, uh, you know, but that's, that's the process. Believe me, once the, once the local Department of Health gets involved, they will tell you what to do, but you should be prepared to cancel any further practices and and you'll get communications of what you need to send out through the tracing process. Uh, follow up from Greg Garofalo, coaches and organizations need to report COVID cases. Doesn't that trigger or require compliance with HIPAA? No, because uh, the, we're not gathering any specific uh, information. We're not sharing any names with any other people in the organization. We're not recording uh, any of this information that so and you know so and so uh, names basically it's an organization knows that we have a child and that they notify the the uh, the authorities and take it from there because it's not been verified. A temperature is a verifiable number, but this is information you know that is verifi verified by the local department of health, and at that way the organization has to step away. Organization could shut down, they can stop, but the organization should not investigate, shouldn't ask for a doctor's letter, they shouldn't do anything like that whatsoever. Excellent. And clarification in regards to a player's family member testing positive. So if it was uh, the coach who was with the kids, and obviously we'd follow the same protocol you just suggested, um, but if it was a family member of a player that had been training with you that tested positive, uh, what are the requirements of the software organization? Same, re same requirements. And um, what will take place is then you'll ask the local Department of Health to say, okay, we have a family member of a child and the family member's never shown up at any, uh, you know, any practices or, or, or training that's taking place. But the child has come. This is when they came. Uh, you, you tell the Department of Health that, you know, the family member's tested positive. They'll give you guidance on what to do with regards to that child, which basically is going to say, uh, first off, is the child shouldn't show up at an next practice if, in fact, they, they're aware of this, um, and that the local authorities will manage it from there. Thank you. Um, we had a few questions um, from directors of soccer organizations regarding return to play plans and submitting um, Act or guidelines to their local uh, authorities, whether they're town or city or board of health. Um, each club's field usage should that be outlined in a plan document and distributed uh, distributed to members. Is that required or recommended? So, it comes from Tim Parker. So, um, so several towns that I've sat in on, they're requiring all of their youth sport organizations 
to submit to them what are the guidelines that they will be following. And that's why we developed what we did in the fashion that we did. It may seem like a lot of information, but when dealing with the local Department of Health and Parks and Rec, there's never too much information. So that's why the guidelines look the way they do. I did share it with the Parks and Rec person. I shared the, our guidelines, I shared our toolkit, I shared our webpage, and they said, you have blown away every other sport that we're trying to work with who wants to conduct activities this phase. So I feel really good about where we are. Um, for those of you still on, on the call, I'm trying to go through the questions in order of um, what's needed immediately, and then those that are related to later phases, we're gonna to lead to a little bit later. Um, we've had a lot of questions in regards to requirements for hand washing, um, hand sanitizing, and porta potties if um, organizations have their own facilities. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about hand washing and sanitization. And it's normal practices as prescribed from the Mass Department of Public Health and the CDC, frequent, plain and simple, frequent, you know, upon arrival, sanitize, upon, you know, uh, that if, well, see what I just did? Okay, fine, oh. please we do this, sanitize. Somebody goes like this, sanitize. Anytime a hand touches a face and then they're gonna be amongst other people, they, they're gonna to have to say, listen, sanitize. Our kids are gonna slowly get used to this. You know, us as adults, you know, we're the ones that, we're the creatures of habit. Kid, kids are so resilient. Okay, fine, I got it, I'll do it. Or I won't touch or they'll call each other out is what they'll do. Uh, so, uh, but that's the frequency for sure. Now let's talk about porta potties. Uh, porta potties, basically, in 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 one of the documents, uh, I'd have to somewhere in the guidelines that that I you know we are all living by. It calls for frequent cleaning. Okay, now frequent cleaning. Um, there's se several definitions because, for example, we've taken a look. Uh, our group has taken a look at. What's re what, what, do you, what do they consider frequent cleaning for cleaning porta potties at construction sites that have just recently opened? Frequent cleaning is that once an hour, somebody has to come by, spray down the handles and the such, but there should be a, a suitable amount of gel or liquid in the porta potty. Uh, it's a matter of just training people how to, you know, if they've uh, used it, is to open the door, keep it open with the foot, and then they do the gel. And then, then they, they walk out opening the door with the foot, not touching anything with their hands. It's just a matter of teaching kids on how to use these techniques techniques and methods. Um, it'd be a good idea that, um, first off, Mass Youth Soccer does not require porta potties to be at a location, but many municipalities do. That if you're going to use the, you know, the Jones Field, <clears throat> you've got to set up a porta potty there. Uh, that's the town requirement. So the town will let you know what your requirements are under the COVID guidelines for that town of what you need to do to, to uh, take care of that porta potty. Uh, for example, at Lancaster, um, when we do open up, we're gonna have a staff person there and their job is gonna be uh, to, uh, you know, with, with a spray bottle and, and paper towels, is gonna be once an hour to go through every porta potty handle and spray it down. That's it. They're not supposed to touch anything, anything else. So, and, and that's what, you know, and that's the guidelines. Um, do you anticipate uh, the potential for local shutdowns later in the year? Um, should there be spikes in specific communities in last year? So, um, I don't know what I anticipate these days. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God. Um, you know, how many years ago did we anticipate Triple E? shutting down because of mosquitoes uh, or stopping play 40 minutes before dusk uh, or, or, or stopping play altogether because, you know, so there could be shutdowns for so many different reasons. Uh, I mean, I, you know, we've had shutdowns in various areas for Triple E, shutdowns for Lyme disease, shutdowns for, uh, you know, uh, for various things. Uh, so uh, basically what it comes down to is that until we have a vaccine, the state will be measuring and monitoring numbers on a daily basis. 
-hmm. If the governor feels that come fall time, for example, uh, we get out of uh, the, the summer months and the flu season ramps up, that um, if we're not practicing proper distancing, hygiene, that we could have a spike. And if that's the case, the governor's going to come and going to say, folks, uh, we're done. Shut it down. Or go back to phase two. Social kids, kids can still play, but social distance. So, um, you know, right now it's the, the, the numbers and everything's looking favorable. But then again, you take a look at, yeah, we're getting spikes in 13 states that went back earlier than we did. Now, a lot of people think that those are basically just small little temporary spikes because everybody went back out there, like the whole state of Arkansas went to one big pool party. Uh, so, you know, you're going to get a spike and then it's going to settle down again. So that's the belief is that a lot of the spikes we're experiencing are, are really going to be short term spikes once we go back into phase two and phase three. Only time will tell. A uh, question from Paul Detail regarding referees. Um, have MSRC or Mass Youth Soccer got any um, particular recommendations or expectations for referees? So um, MSRC had a meeting last night. A lot of great discussion topics took place. Um, I really feel comfortable and confident that not only does MSRC have a, a, a good understanding of what's taking place, but they also have just as much of a uh, confusion level as a lot of us have. Uh, they're not the only ones, especially when it comes to sports officials. So uh, somebody was saying, how is a sports official going to be able to manage a game where kids have to stay six feet apart? Well, they'll never have to do it because as long as they're six feet apart, there won't be any games, plain and simple. And if you note uh, that what came out from the governor uh, was that for this phase, there's no referees, umpires, or sports permitted, which basically means no games. So when games do start, um, there will be guidelines. U.S. Soccer is working on guidelines uh, for the referees. Um, it's going to be a matter of making sure that referees uh, aren't closer than six feet to any players, which in fact, if they are, they're not doing a good job. Um, but with youth referees at the U7, U8, U6 level, where a referee typically becomes a part of the educational process, um, there will be some gu guidance, you know, for those children because they're sometimes teaching a, ch a child how to do a throw-in, or you know, or they're going over and they're helping a child up. Some of those things are going to have to change. We're going to have to develop some new habits uh, going forward. There's even been some talk about not letting whistle uh, referees use whistles. Yeah, that they might use a clicker or an electronic whistle, you know, that they, they make. It's a battery operator because they're afraid if the referee blows on a whistle, spittle will go everywhere and infect the whole, the whole pitch. So, um, I, I'm a, listen, as a, as, a, as a referee, I'm following this closely because I want to make sure that, uh, that, that I understand what's taking place and, and that I can help my fellow referees be just as cautious. Thank you. Um, can you explain a little bit more as to why coaches uh, can coach two groups of nine or less um, back to back with a 30 minute gap, but they can't coach two uh, groups of nine or less side by side? So the, uh, the reason being is that following the child and daycare uh, model is um, that in a childcare or daycare and it were a summer camp, that's the model. So you have a counselor that's assigned to a group of kids and you could have a counselor assigned to a group of kids in the morning and then assigned to a different group of kids in the afternoon. Because it could be a YMCA camp, a parks and rec camp that is an AM program and a PM program. And so that they're gonna have counselors that are working there. So following that model, they're letting a counselor be with one group and then another group because from the, from the attendance and everything, they know exactly who that person's person's around, okay? It's manageable in, in that fashion. Uh, so when you've got, 
you know, a, two groups side by side where the coach can't go back and forth, what is happening is that you're, you're, you're doubling an exposure possibility uh, or quadrupling if you're letting that coach go from one group to the other to the other doing four different groups. So it's to try to minimize as much as possible the, the exposure. The other part too is that their expectation is that, is, uh, for example, when I talked about clinics, a child you know, can only come to one clinic and then that's it. They're, for the hour and a half, whatever, done. They can't go to three clinics in one day. So they're trying to reduce the spread based on, based on numbers. Is it a perfect science? Absolutely not. It isn't. But everything that we can do to mitigate the spread, we're going we're gonna to apply that. Who is responsible for policing spectators uh, in phase two? And if a parent does not want to wear a mask and is still practicing social distancing, um, what recourse do we have? So first off, phase two does not have spectators. Spectators attend games. They spectate. Phase two is parents, guardians, or chaperones. Okay, so no grandparents, nobody like that, is that it's one per child only. Okay, now let's talk about that one per child that decides that it's my right, whatever it is. Okay, fine. I'm not going to go down that slippery slope. It's a requirement from the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth, under the current orders, is that all people in this state will practice physical distancing, and when they're closer than somebody within, you know, can be can be within six feet, they will wear a mask. That is a that is a requirement for uh, spectators, parents attending these sessions. If somebody refuses, the coach will simply ask the parent, please take your child and go home. If it elevates from there, that's called 911. Plain and simple. Don't try and police it yourself. Don't try and no. call yourself an authority. That's it's basically what it comes down to. Uh, we've talked to several police departments, you know, uh, and I've been on some uh, some phone calls as phase two and youth sports is coming about. Um, they're dealing with this right now with restaurants in various other states and now our state. They're dealing with this uh, in, in so many different ways. Uh, so that's what it comes down to. You just basically will, will let now if they if they also if they really are belligerent refuse to the organization the club or town can actually take further action against them. They could they could they could take disciplinary plenary action against the parent for not following proper procedures and protocols. Thank you. Are there any special recommendations or requirements for COVID survivors? For those that have had COVID-19 and are returning to play? Uh, nothing more than what the Department of, uh, the local Department of Health and the DPH uh, provides. There has been no guidelines that have been prepared for them uh, or, or those types of participants. Uh, we're going to take a deep dive into equipment now. Um, what constitutes equipment? Um, how should we clean equipment and sanitize equipment? If we move goals, do we have to wipe them down, um, et cetera? So if you can provide some insight, I don't know, Ian, if you might want to jump in as well um, regarding cones, soccer balls, poles, ladders, uh, yeah. goals, whatever might be used. I, I think maybe the easiest way to look at this is anything that can be touched by the hands and physically moved is considered equi soccer equipment and needs to be disinfected as best you possibly can. That that would be the easiest way to cover that. Yeah. You know. And it should only be touched by the, the coach. That's it. Yes, and only only sanitized by the coach. Yep. Parents, uh parents or, or players are not supposed to move any goals or move any cones, move any sticks or training sticks or anything along those lines. Coach only. So once again, folks, phase two, short phase, practice only. Mm -hmm don't bring every toy in the trick that you have in the garage to practice. Keep it simple, Simon. Yes. Uh, and, and I would just add to that. Uh, it, it's not really an equipment thing, but there was a couple of comments in the, 
in the chat box about why are we inconsistent with other sports in terms of the use of hands. We're not being inconsistent. We're not saying that you cannot use your hands. We're just being a bit more cautious than other sports, saying that if the hands are used, well, we're going to take measures to make sure that that area is safe to use and that equipment is safe to use. We are trying to get through this thing, hopefully, in three weeks. Please don't hold me to that. But we are trying to get through this thing in the best way that we possibly can. And we all know soccer, you're going to exert yourself, you're going to sweat, and the virus is spread through droplets. Um, we just prefer not to have that happen. So we're not being inconsistent. We're just being a bit more strict, potentially, than other sports. That's, that's all I would say there. We're not saying you cannot use hands. Thank you. I was going to uh, throw you a softball for the next question with that one, but we uh, don't need to. Um, Mike, a couple of uh, requests for an update on districts. I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in case you join us a little late, that district select program is, uh, we really want to hold district selects this summer. Uh, the phase three starts June 29th or the week after, or even two weeks later than that. Our plans uh, that if we can have games, uh, that we will hold them at Lancaster. We'll have a district select program. It'll start uh, two weeks following July 4th. We typically start at the week after July 4th. So it'll be two weeks after July 4th. We'll need enough time for registrations, get everything together. It's going to be an extremely modified version. A uh, couple of things. Number one, there won't be a tournament. Um, number two, there won't be uh, any double header games. Um, it's going to be arrive, play, and go home. Uh, so to try and minimize congregation time and, and, and the such. We're not sure what phase three is going to allow us to do. I highly doubt that the governor is going to say, hey, phase three, just have at it. We think there still be the restrictions for congregating and, and the distancing. So that's what we're going to be building our model on. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's the, the pathway that we're, we're going to, uh, down for districts at this time. Uh, we had a question regarding top soccer um, in phases two and three. Um, top soccer, physical contact is a big part of their social interaction. So do we have any recommendations or insight uh, for top soccer players and um, their coaches? That's, that's a, it's, it's a very uh, great question, an important question. Um, so at, at, at this time, I've got it on my to-do list to follow up with the Department of, uh, of Public Health uh, with regards to uh, what they have in place for daycare, uh, for child summer camps, and, and those types of programs uh, for uh, top soccer um, similar children. And so uh, once we have a better understanding of that, then we're going to go and see if we if we can apply those practices to our top soccer program. Because um, we understand and we fully aware that, uh, that, that touch is a very important part of the process, the guidance, the being there for the child and, and the such. Um, it just may call, call for just an, an incredible overabundance of, of PPE caution, uh, gloves, uh, masks, no touching of the face during the process, proper sanitization, uh, and, and managing the child with, with, with those practices as well. So we're going to work on that. So we, 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 we ask that our top soccer folks have a little bit of patience with us over the next week or so on this phase. But we'll, that's something that's very important to us and we'll be looking at. Excellent. Uh, we are coming towards the end of our questions, so if you do have any more questions, please type them in the Q&A uh, function, and we will try and get to them. Um, next question is for Ian. Um, as a DOC, am I able to observe um, all four sessions taking place at the same time if I stay within the 20-foot buffer zone? Um, if not, do you have any recommendations? Is it just able to observe? Yeah, so uh, you have... Actual wording is, can I stay in the cross section and manage sessions for all four sec uh, sections? Yeah, that, that's, that's what I thought it said. There's a, there's a bit of a difference between manage and observing, let me tell you. Um, can you do it? Uh, uh, yeah, but you, have to, you, you understand the inherent risk that you're taking on there because you've now got to manage the incoming and outgoing of 40 
at Pentwell, there would be 39 other people. Uh, and I'm not sure that you would want to take that on in Actually, the next three weeks. Ian, they, um, they can't be, the buffer zone is no man's land. They can't be at the crossroad, no man's land. So they can observe from well outside the confines of the playing area, equivalent to where spectators would be. And if they want to yell in stuff, all, they can yell in all they want, but they cannot go in unless they're in one quadrant, their coach one and nine players. And then right. they, can yell, they can yell to the others, but mm -hmm. buffer zone is in no man's land. Right. Yeah, the difference between observe and manage there, Jolly. Right. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. A uh, quick question from Ed Jenkinson, which I can answer. Uh, the earliest possible date for phase three would be June 29th. Um, there's no guarantees that that's actually going to take place. Um, again, we're at the liberty of uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, on that front. Uh, we had a question from David Dubay regarding um, tryouts prior to the fall season. Um, can you give an update on our stance and or recommendation for tryouts um, prior to the fall season kicking off? So um, first, let's talk about you know a, a start. Tryouts are up to the organization as to when they want to run them. Um, if you are a part of a league that has a tryout window, you just have to make sure that you follow what that league's tryout window is, which would most likely be either the CCLNE or the uh, NECSL. Uh, with regards to any other leagues not under our jurisdiction or sanctioning. It's, you'd have to figure out what, what that requirement is. Um, but most town-based systems uh, don't have a tryout window because kids can really only try out for their town. You can, uh, you can start actually performing assessments in this phase right now, but it would truly only be individual ball skill assessments. Right. You wouldn't be able to assess how a player uh, you know, attacks or defends or just or well, maybe distribute yes, but uh, but you'd be rather limited. Come phase three, you've got all of July and August. If we can get into phase three in first week of July, and games are available, then you've got two full months to conduct your assessments. Um, you know, we we had a uh, an incredible coaching conversations. Uh, session on tryouts. The video is available on our website under the coaching session and there's more information about conducting tryouts uh, in that coaching conversations video so we invite you to watch that uh, rather than me share everything that was shared in that in that video. Yeah I, I would say in phase two it's very brave to take that on in phase two. It's almost a buyer beware for me because it, 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 this is what it does. It conjures up the image of those guys who are absolute brilliant jugglers who can put a soccer ball in a basketball hoop from 45 feet away. And you wonder why these guys are not making millions of dollars as professional players. So they've got something, but it just doesn't, it doesn't compute or relate to or transfer to anything that goes on on the field. So as soon as you take away that competitive element of having an opponent, things always change. And even more so, I would suggest, for children. So I would, I would be hesitant about thinking about setting up individual assessments. Um, but if you're brave enough, go for it. I, I would just follow those words of advice. I'd also add that it would likely be um, part of our continuing education as we move into phase three. Yeah, for sure. Um, both in document form and um, on webinar of what we can really do given the context um, yeah. of phase three when we know it. Uh, yeah. What are our thoughts on the use of non-contact digital thermometers prior to sessions by coaches? Our thoughts are do not use them, don't bring yeah. it. Do not don't record, do, do not take nor record anybody's temperature. That's the parent's responsibility prior to then bringing to their, their child. Yeah. Thank you. Um, when coaching younger kids, how do we handle the balls leaving their quadrant or kicking their balls into other kids' space? Ian. A coach retrieval, feet only. Coach, get active. <laughs> maybe, you can, maybe you can leave your workout for the day and that'll become your workout for the day. Uh, question regarding the group of 10 players, once it's established, uh, should we assume that 
new players shouldn't be added or if someone drops, um, is it, are we able to add players? Are we also able to swap players between nights? So during an actual training session, there's no swapping of players from one group to another. So right. coach has his pre-plan and he's got eight players show up and he's got space for one. If he would like to move a player from one group to another before practice starts, that's, that's entirely okay. But the second they step on the pitch and practice starts, that group cannot be changed, broken, or moved. Thank you. Um, so I believe we've come to the end of our official questions. We've had a couple of comments come in um, regarding Ian's haircut and does he know that barbershops are open in Massachusetts now? Um, so I thought I'd share those with you. Um, do we have any more insight into when the state may release more details on requirements for phase three? Um, yeah, I have a, a magic uh, eight ball that I, <laughs> <laughs> that I go to, yeah. <laughs> when is phase three going to start? <laughs> um, you know what, it's, I wish I could tell you. Right now, honestly, uh, the numbers came out today, they were good numbers. Uh, we're gonna see a spike in a few days from the, uh, from the recent gatherings that have been taking place. Um, and we're going we're, we're gonna to see a spike for sure. Yeah. Probably going to see another spike uh, take place. Um, now that we're into phase two, more people getting out, restaurants are opening up. So that could just be a temporary, temporary bump. Uh, the reason why the, the, the Gov is going to three weeks minimum is so that when a phase starts, we've got that 14 day period to see, okay, on day 15, what are our numbers looking like? And then, um, and then we'll move, you know, we'll move forward from there. And that's exactly what the governor did. That's why the governor didn't announce officially that phase two was starting until Saturday before the Monday. He was waiting to the last possible time. His data was saying, let's make this move. That's what's going to happen uh, with phase three. Um, we got to believe that, you know, phase three will permit, you know, uh, the sport the way it's supposed to be played. We were hoping that's the way it was going to be in this phase. We, we got to believe that that's, that's going to be the next thing for a lot of different reasons. For the kids wanting to play the games, for the parents wanting to get the games going. And it's also an economic decision as well. There's a lot of facilities out there, uh, hockey rinks, indoor uh, volleyball, basketball, I can go on and on, that pretty much are shut down until they can start having games and summer tournaments, whether they're local or not, running. So we know it'll be better, we're just not sure exactly what it is. Uh, ben Myers would like to know where you get your haircuts, Mike. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we'll finish. We'll thanks, finish with Thank you very much. I get him. Yeah. So Dana's just uh, taken on the role of president of an organization with 700 um, players. Uh, she asked what the top five things, or if you can emphasize the absolute must have must do's for their organization to be started earlier. I started her off um, with one and two by saying, make sure you read the guidelines, um, assess the checklist, and get together with your board of directors to go through those two documents. So if you could follow up, Mike, with uh, what the absolute essentials must do so that our organization should be looking to do so that they can get ahead with us. Uh, I mean, what you shared, it's, it's go through that checklist, um, understand the guidelines and go through the check. If you can check everything off on that checklist, you're ready to go. And I will tell you this, you, you, you much further down that checklist than you think you would be. Uh, we all have, have PPE, we've been using it, whether it's for, uh, you know, going to the stores or going, some of us who are, have returned to work or essential workers. Um, people get it, they understand it. It's just a matter of making sure that we get the guidelines uh, in, in each of those pages to each parent. If you send anything out, just send the parent page out or at least send them the link to the guidelines, send the link and tell them go to page what X, whatever that is for parents and read this. You don't have to read everything else, same thing Read this for parents and players. Coaches read this. Um, it's uh, it's that's we we build it 
so that you, you've got what you need. I don't think there's any, there's, there isn't any one priority because everything on there must be checked off. Yeah, I, I would, if you need any assistance with coach training, please don't hesitate. Don't okay. hesitate to reach right. out. That's another thing, folks. Yeah. yeah. You've got Ian, you have Loy, you have Tommy. Reach out. They're all up to date on all of this. They can help you out. If you have any further questions about the guidelines and some interpretations, reach out to me or Tammy Endell, who is one of the primary authors of, of the document, uh, putting it together uh, th there at our office. So we're here to help. Don't, don't hesitate to email us. We're at the end of our questions. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, we will share this uh, recording on our website um, later in the week. Uh, but as always, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions whatsoever. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your attendance. Thanks.